The Old Testament reading for today is from Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9, and is found in the Old Testament section of your pew Bible on page 694. Listen. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. For ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hands of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The New Testament reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, in the New Testament section on page 166. <coughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to you, my God, always, for you became because of the grace of God that has been given you in Jesus Christ. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last Sunday, um, our first Advent worship service, we ended that worship service with the prayers of the people. Do you remember that? John Thomas read a headline from the week's news, and then Emily or I prayed a petition around that headline. U.S. adds planes to bolster drive to wipe out ISIS. And we prayed for peace. Israel shaken by five deaths in synagogue assault. And we prayed then for religious tolerance. Security in Ferguson is tightened after night of violent unrest. And we prayed for an end to racial stereotypes and distrust. Why do we pray the prayers of the people? Why do you pray for others?
I would venture to say that we pray because we know there are things in the world that are not right. We know there is suffering. And we know that we are not created to suffer. We know that children die from preventable disease. We know the aftermath of flood or drought. We know people with debilitating conditions. We know what it is to be betrayed by a trusted friend or colleague or family member. You and I know that there are things in the world that are not right. And we know that there are things in our own lives that are not right. And so we pray. We pray to the only one who can make things right. And we pray to the one who walks with us even when things are not right. We pray. And the only reason we can pray is because we hope. We know that things are not right with the world. We know that things are not right with ourselves because we have a vision for how life can be, right? We have a vision for how our lives can be. And that is a vision that's fed not by consumer ads. It's not fed by pie-in-the-sky optimism. Ours is a vision fueled by the biblical story and fueled by our own experience of God. We believe in a God who makes all things new, and you and I have experienced that newness at some point in our lives, or we have seen something new being made in the world. We've seen and witnessed transformation. We believe in a God who makes all things new. The season of Advent reminds you and me that we are people of God's future. It's not a future of our making. It is a future of God's making. And it is a future in which there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Not just a polished up old one, but a brand new one. And the scriptural texts for Advent point us to the God who is bringing about that future. So Advent is a forward-looking time. But it's also a backward-looking time. In today's reading from Isaiah, we encounter a passionate prayer for God to come and reveal the power and strength and goodness that the people had known in years past. Isaiah prays fervently. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. And with that prayer, Isaiah reminds both God and the people of Israel about their history together. God is in charge of the world, Isaiah proclaims, and Isaiah does not want the people to forget about God's sovereignty. And at the same time, Isaiah does not want God to forget about the people who need God's sovereignty. It's about their journey together. Isaiah is reminding them both. God is and has been faithful. That's why we hope. That's the only basis we have for hoping about the future because God is and has been faithful in the past. That's why you and I have a vision for life, have a vision for situations. That's why you and I have a vision for institutions that are different than the ones that we know now because we know the God who is making all things new. There is some unrest with how things are in the world. We are discomfited, so to speak. We, are cha- we chafe at the way things are because we know how things can be. So what newness do you yearn for? What newness? Do you yearn for?
people tell me that they don't like change. And I understand that. Believe me, I do. There is great comfort and ease in the known and in the familiar. And change actually is all about grief. And very few of us would choose to grieve if we didn't need to. A friend of mine, Jim Brown, many, many years ago when I worked at the General Assembly, and he was the executive director, shared this definition of transition, which I know you've heard before. I'm sure I've used it before. Transition is Linus with his blanket in the dryer. We don't like change. But without change, all of those things that you and I yearn for cannot come to pass. Without change, that new heaven and that new earth cannot come to pass. Now, I know that with today's congregational action on my request to dissolve the pastoral relationship, I know that that makes the landscape here at Lewinsville change. And I do know that change is difficult for many of you, and this change in particular. And it's difficult for me as well. But I encourage you, as I encourage myself, in the midst of our anxiety about these changes, to think about what it is you yearn for. Think about what it is that you yearn for yourself in your own spiritual life. Think about what it is you yearn for our congregation. Think about what it is that you yearn for the world in which we minister. What is it that you do yearn for? If you could pray, Oh Lord, that you would tear open the heavens and come down and fix just this one thing. What would that one thing be? What do you yearn for? You and I can yearn for something better because we know God to have been faithful in the past, forward-looking and backward-looking. God has been present with us as a congregation to grant us a vision of an affordable retirement residence in our own backyard. God has been present with us to grant us the perseverance necessary to pursue what was needed in building an award-winning assisted living facility, Chesterbrook Residences. God has been present with us as a congregation when we started a ministry for runaway youths, now known as Alternative House. God has been present with us when beloved members of our church community have died. God has been with us and present when newcomers come through these doors and we are blessed by their gifts and their skills and new friendships are formed. God has been present and faithful. God has been present and faithful as our children, generations of children, have learned Bible stories. As they have grown in their own discipleship of faith, and they know that they are an integral part of our community. God has been present with us in the past. And because we trust God's faithfulness, we do believe in an alternative future. We do have hope. And it's that hope that pulls us forward through difficult times of change because we trust that God is at work in the midst of that change. We trust that the blanket's going to come out of the dryer. We trust that God is at work to bring about the only future that God can bring. So Advent is the season of the church year that opens you and me up to the need for God to break into our lives for God to break into the life of our congregation, to, for God to break into the life of our community and our world. 
And Advent affords you and me the opportunity just to reflect and stop and think and realize how God interacts with humankind every day. That God is active right now, bringing about that new heaven and that new earth. You see, Advent is more than a time to hear God's promises about, to hear promises about God. Advent is a season of attentiveness to the presence of God already active among us. And the bread and the wine of this table are those tangible and tasty reminders that God is among us to bring about that for which we yearn. At this table, we remember. The tablecloth on the front says, do this, what? In remembrance of me. At this table, we remember. The same God who is present in Jesus Christ, in bread and in wine, has been and is present in our lives and in the life of our congregation. And that remembrance becomes then the foundation on which you and I stand yearning forward in hope. Every time you and I are aware of God's presence today, that awareness strengthens our hope for the future that God is bringing about. So in Advent, we remember God's actions of the past. We are aware of God's presence and actions and answers to prayer today. And we yearn and we watch in hope and in faith. So what is it that you yearn for? Watch for. Wait for it. Come, taste and see. The Lord is good.